Neck throughs, guitars, they're like a guy that won't have a beer with you. I want to hear what's pushing the notes. Freddie King and B.B. King, Albert King, and let's not forget Burger King. I don't want to blow my knuckle out. Stainless steel is the work of the devil. These go to 11. From the East Amplification Tone Labs in Baltimore, Maryland, it's the Amps and Axes Show. With your hosts, Jeff the Godfather of Low Wattage Amps Bober and Mick Marcelino. Well, good day to you, Mr. Bober. Good day to you, Mr. Marcelino. How be you? Oh, it is a, it is a glorious day. It is. Uh, we had all sorts of crap come through last <laughs> night, and as soon as it was done, it was 20 degrees cooler out. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. It went from like 95 to 75 in the stretch of a couple yeah, hours. Yeah, very different. Yeah. Uh, That's nice. We got to thank our fans. Thank uh, you, fans. <laughs> and all the new ones that we, <laughs> we just got today. Yeah, yeah. There's, uh, oh, wow. there's something going on. It there's, was the craziest spike I've ever seen in my life. There's something going on. But keep it up. Yes, you know? please. Yes. We will love you. Long time. A long time. That's right. And, uh, of course, always go to ampsandaccesscast.com. That's right. You can get all the shows there. Mm -hmm. And you can get all of our uh, social media uh, stuff there, too. You can click on the little icons, go out, follow us, like us, right, do all the, that good stuff. Hit them little button things. Go out to iTunes, definitely give us the five stars. We would love that. Absolutely. And please. Who doesn't like five stars? Uh, you know, oh, yeah, exactly. And uh, Hotels we, and podcasts, you know? <laughs> <laughs> That's true. It's so weird. I know, isn't it? Yeah, that is kind of weird. <laughs> Um, also, uh, you know, uh, thank you for cl clicking through the Amazon banner, which is on our front page. Mm -hmm. Remember, you click through there, you buy your product. Guess what? Doesn't cost you a cent more. No. Nope. Amazon and, and, decides to throw us a couple dollars. And, and you bookmark it, and anytime you purchase through Amazon, just just go right back to the bookmark. Right back to that. Makes it easy for you. Yes, makes it beautiful for us. That's right. Done. And there's a PayPal button there too. If you feel so kind, we love all that stuff. And of course, Jason. Jason. Sadidas. It's just a crazy Quick man. He does it. Just crazy. Just puts it out there every mm -hmm. week. And uh, he you, he will not uh, leave you uh, uh, disappointed. Uh, no. You will mm. not be disappointed. You may uh, be frustrated. Dazed and confused, <laughs> but not disappointed. Exactly. <laughs> but not disappointed. So, so anyway. Okay. I got I got something I wanted to talk to you about real quick here. All right. Okay. So, we you know, we've we've touched around. We've danced around the whole fractal thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is true. And, uh, you know, it, it seems like more and more guys are starting to, you know, they're, they're using it one way or another, whether they use it in the studio or they use it on uh, fly dates. Or um, now we're starting to see with like these matrix power amps and stuff that it's very, you know, it's a very flat power amp. Mm -hmm. And uh, but it creates a ton of wattage. And these guys are plugging the fractals into the, the matrix type power amps that are just solid state, clean. They just do what they do. And then running through 412 cabinets. So they're actually getting the fractal to react like a real amp. Right? Uh, to a certain, certain degree. Extent, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, but it's a very expensive venture. Yeah. You know, if you buy one of those new, I think they can be upwards of like four grand. Whew, right? The foot controller alone is like $1,000. Wow. Yeah, it's not cheap. Um, but there is an alternative, and I wanted to kind of tell everybody about this alternative, which I think is very cool. Cool. So one of our old guests, Mr. Gary Hoey, uh, mm. is an endorser of this product. It's 11 rack, right? Mm -hmm. Now, 11 rack is Avid's version of the Fractal, okay? And it's a, it's, it's a live unit. And it's a studio unit. Okay, you can go do different ways. You can run out of the. You can. Well, the good part is, and this is kind of neat. On the front of this thing, you got an input for your guitar, and then there's an output for your amp. So it just goes in, and then if you got a rack sitting on top of your head, you just mm -hmm. go whoop with a little three foot power patch cord or whatever, mm -hmm. and you're into the input. Well, there's also a second output on the back. So if you want to go into the effects loop and just use the power amp, you can do that too. 
Okay. So you get a couple options there. Right. But inside there, too, you have two uh, XLR direct outs that you can run right to the board. So you can have the feel on stage. Now, you can do this with the fractal, too. You can have the feel on stage from your amplifier. Mm-hmm. And then be running the simulated amp through the PA system directly. No microphones would be needed on stage. Right. You know, so there, there's a couple ways to skin the cat. But I, I checked it out. And the thing that I like about it is it looks a little bit more intuitive than the uh, than the fractal. And it's that would be nice. Yeah. And it's got very high power processing and all. And, uh, you know, they the the guys behind it are Pro Tools. It's Avid. It's Avid. Right. 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 So, if you go to Sweetwater right now, and today is the 24th of June, okay? Okay. Uh, as we record this, on Sweetwater site, you get the full-blown version of Pro Tools with the 11 rack for five ninety nine. dollars Wow. Well, but, but that's just software, right? And the hardware. You get the unit. Oh, really? And when you get the unit, really? you get a full-blown copy of Pro Tools. Wow. Yeah. They brought it down 100 bucks. It used to be, well, when it first came out, it was like $1,100. Well, it sure beats 4000 And then they brought it down to $700, and now they got it down to like 600 bucks. Now, if you buy the foot controller, their ground control with it, mm-hmm. it takes it up to 1000 bucks. But for 1000 bucks, you have a full MIDI complement, and you have the 11 rack and you get Pro Tools. And Pro Tools. <laughs> now, when you put it into Pro Tools, the plugin that pops up is crazy easy. Because, see, what you get when you're inside the unit, it's got a pretty good matrix screen on it, right? That mm-hmm. you can move things around. But it's a little, you know, it's a little cumbersome, right? Okay. So, when you have the software hooked up, you know, when you have your laptop or whatever hooked up mm-hmm. to the USB... Then you start getting pictures of, of like amplifier fronts with knobs, mm-hmm. and it's the knobs that correspond. Like if you pull up the Tube Screamer, you don't get all these crazy, you know, some of the older programs, you would get like 17 different uh, variables that you could change. No, you get a picture of a Tube Screamer with three knobs. With three knobs. Volume, Good. tone, Good. and distortion. I like that. Right? Or gain. Mm-hmm. So that's how it works. And uh, very convincing. They have crazy high-speed processors inside of it, so it has no latency whatsoever. And this is the the hardware itself. The, it's the hardware wow. itself. Yep, and uh, it's two U, so it's two U, mm-hmm. you know, high, but two rack spaces high. Yeah, and it's a uh, nineteen inches wide. It's standard it's, rack right. rack gear. Um, the cool part that's a little bit different with the uh, with the fractal. Fractal uses the RJ forty five like uh, line six for their pedal, right? Okay. So it looks like a network cable. Right. Okay. So that makes it proprietary. You're not going to really get away from that. I think they have some MIDI stuff on the back. I may be wrong, and I know somebody somebody will definitely show me a picture, and I'll be wrong. But with the uh, with with the 11 rack, it's just a MIDI connector. So okay. it's standard stuff. Mm-hmm. It's not like you got to go get a proprietary pedal to run this thing. It's standard stuff. And the, so it's 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 the regular yeah the five five pin, pin din yeah, the MIDI yeah, din connector exactly yeah. and I think it might be seven to run power out to the foot controller okay you know there's two the extra that mm-hmm. go for the power you know um, but what an amazing product that you can use anywhere really and uh, it doesn't cost you a fortune and it it's it's very convincing. Now you can the unit that you get the hardware the mm-hmm. two racks. I mean, there's controls on the front panel. You can do yeah yeah. So there's there's these little buttons that you push and it takes you into different scenarios. So if you want to just get to the front end of the amplifier, mm-hmm. you push a button. It's I think it's called SW. And what it does is it lights up and then you got five you got all your knobs right there, hmm. and you just turn the knobs corresponding with the bass, the treble, the gain, the whatever. And uh, they change color when you do that. And you see the value change, and then you can just do a save, save real quick. Right, and right. so when you're live on stage, if you're not hearing things that are sounding right, you can actually push that, go and change your bass, your mid, your treble, and get your volume, you know, get it to where, you know, because you know how it is. Rooms change. Right. And, uh, but very impressive. And, and then there's a video on uh, Sweetwater's site where Gary Hoey, is it on, uh, it's sponsored by Sweetwater, it's on YouTube. Gary Hoey plays outside live. He doesn't have an amp on the stage, and somehow he gets feedback through the monitor system. 
Wow. And he holds a note, and it just rings, and it's not harsh. It, it sounds like he's getting an amp to feed back. It's pretty cool. Wow. Yeah, he's also a Fluence uh, uh, pickup uh, endorser. Oh, really? Fishman? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So he's got those in a Strat, and then he uses that because he's a big avid Pro Tools guy. Mm -hmm. He was a big Rocktron endorser. I'm sure he still is. The one key, remember we always talk about this, the one key that he does that he said really makes a difference, he bought uh, Ibanez TS-09. TS-9? TS-9. TS-9? It was TS-8, TS-9. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 808, whatever it is. Right. It's a tube screamer. 808, yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. He puts that before the 11 rack. And he says that adds the thing. Remember, we were talking to the one guy who said he does a little thing before he goes mm -hmm. into the fractal. That's what you got to do. You kind of got to do that to kind of give it a little bit of something. He said, so what he, what he does is it, you know, he'll use a tube screamer inside the thing. But he actually puts a tube screamer before it. And what's different from the fractal that the 11 rack has that the fractal doesn't is they have this smart technology that understands what you're using um for a guitar and it adapts on the fly wow it's automatic so like say you got um say you got humbuckers and you split them mm -hmm. it'll adapt itself for the split pickup and it really does bring out kind of that strat tone from the oh, that's pickup. crazy yeah that's... yeah so when you go hot it actually adapts itself and it makes the humbucker a little now, bit now now are, are there amp models in this? tons of them. tons of them. yeah yeah and they they're constantly doing this stuff wow. now fractal's a little bit more ahead on that because they have so many professional artists yeah so they're constantly you know revisions 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 wow and they they listen to the audience pretty good but if you <laughs> there's a big difference in price here man huge I mean, it's, it's a giant giant huge. leap to go from the 11 rack what has you know has the software that everybody wants pro tools pro tools to uh That's fractal crazy. which has nothing and it has software to manipulate it but mm -hmm. it's now but it's not recording software yeah I mean, and the fractal mm -hmm. will plug in though it'll plug in anything mm -hmm. just like the 11 rack will but we're talking apples and oranges in price man oh wow that, yeah that's crazy yep and he, uh, and he put a basement up. You know, they, they, they show a demo. They put a basement up. It sounded like a basement. Wow. I mean, it really did sound like a basement. Wow. You know, so he said that it, it's kind of, and it reacts like a real basement. Like, you know, when you crank it, it well, gets See, I think that's and, that's the, when you said put the uh, tube screamer in front, I think that is a huge key element because it, A, it gives you kind of a buffer between the guitar and, and the input of this, well, I, I guess it's somewhat analog, but it's 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 a very digital device, you know. Uh, but I think the interaction between the guitar and the tube screamer is something that we're all kind of used to. Yeah. You know, we know what the tube screamer... The tube screamer is going to react like a tube screamer, mm -hmm. and it's going to do what a tube screamer does when you turn your volume down, yep. when you change your pickups and all that. So it's it, it it's like this familiarity in in a touch and feel and response that the guitar player is used to mm -hmm. and then you go into all this technology i think it's a great idea to do that yeah yeah and, wow and the the one thing the guy from avid was saying the difference between theirs and a lot of these other ones is that uh with that reactive front end that piece that they created mm -hmm. to react to the guitars you kind of feel it a little bit more now see that that may uh, that may not, quote unquote, react the way it's supposed to when there's a box in front first. Actually, they said no. They said that is... it. it really? It understands what it. What the hell? They, they said whatever it's doing, whatever you're doing to that signal, it will react accordingly to that. This is crazy. I must so you one. can't like go harsh in front, you know, because mm -hmm. like a lot of times when you take one of these, uh, when you take one of these modeling things, if you push something in the front end of it, it'll get brittle. It'll get really weird kind of... Mm -hmm you know too much you know like something's not right coming out of your guitar well this thing adapts because guys like to use real wah pedals so you're going to put that before you get in there mm -hmm. you know guys like to use maybe their oh, own delay and crazy. stuff like that so yeah it's pretty I'm, neat i'm gonna have to i'm gonna have to check one out somewhere, yeah somewhere somehow yeah but it's cool that you get you get pro tools yeah that's awesome i mean in and of pro itself tools by a, itself is like 700 dollars. yeah yeah, so they're giving is, it to you with nuts. that. They're, yeah, they're pretty much giving you yeah. the full-blown 
Pro Tools and software. I think I know why. I think it's the marketing is is that they're not moving as many because everybody says fractal. Frac- it's the beta, you know. It's mm-hmm. it's the beta max of the modeling <laughs> stuff compared to fractal because fractal is the is the Mac Dad. That's the one that you see every professional out on the road with. Right. right. You don't see any professionals with the eleven rack. Maybe Gary Hoey. Well, let's see some professionals out there with the eleven rack, and uh, you know, it's cool that it reacts to, to different guitars differently. That's crazy. yeah, yeah. So that's very cool, and thank you for, for bringing that. I, I didn't know anything about that. But speaking of different guitars, oh, talk about different guitars. Uh, we uh, we we have a hell of a guest today. Uh, we um, we have someone who was one of the. Uh, one of the fathers of one of the very cool guitar companies back in the day. And uh, I, I was almost fortunate enough to uh, purchase one of his guitars, one of their guitars back in the day, but the place I went didn't have them. And I got you know, persuaded into checking out something else instead of driving an hour to find what I really wanted. But <laughs> anyway, um, uh, you will be as surprised as we are to... To find out all that this man has done and who he's worked with and for and, uh, you know, just his whole life story, kind of, uh, if if he has time for it. So um, we'll be back momentarily with our guest of the week, um, the uh, one of the founders uh, and the big guy behind Hamer Guitars, Mr. Joel Danzig. Ciao ragazzi, sono Daniele Gottardo e state ascoltando Amps and Access. Okay, and as promised, we are back with our guest of the week, Mr. Joel Danzig. Joel, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy day to be on with us, man. I appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. Glad to be here. We always like to find out about gear and, and you know, what got you into the, to the manufacturing process. And, you know, we'll talk about some of the, the cool stuff you've done and who you've done it for. But with a lot of these, I, you know, I like to what I call jump in the way back machine and go back to the beginning and find out where where our guests came from and what got them into the music business or music industry of in the beginning. So, uh, Joel, where'd you come from and what, you know, what bit you with the music bug, man? And where did you start? How did you start? I think like a lot of people my age started with surf music and uh, just what you hear on the radio. There was a, actually, it's kind of interesting because I think that you could probably trace, for every guitar player, you could probably trace it back to that one moment in time. And let me ask you, I mean, can you remember the first time that you were aware of a guitar? The first time that you heard a guitar? And you recognize it as such? Specifically, I don't know. I mean, I I personally, and a lot of people, we've had people tell us where they've started and there are like two main focuses of where it starts for people but i'm one of the people that pretty much the music bug came from the beatles you know and the ed solomon show yeah and that's and that's a big one that's a real big one for me it was a little earlier than that i was at camp i was about 10 years old and at day camp and one of the counselors brought brought an electric guitar you know electric with quotes around it because Mm -hmm. that's what it was back then You know, I'd never seen anything like it. He turned it on, and we're in a school gymnasium, a high school gymnasium. And, you know, he played something really, really mild, really tame, something like uh, green sleeves or, you know, it's so innocuous. Like now you wouldn't even listen to it, but it just seemed so amazing to me. It it seemed so loud compared to my violin or or piano. Mm. And uh, I thought that we were running out of the room. We thought the windows were going to break. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, I mean, I thought that was the coolest thing ever. It had all these buttons and dials on it. And, you know, of course, it triggered that. And it was it was loud. I was into race cars and and I loved motorcycles. I mean, I I didn't ride yet, but I loved seeing that Mm -hmm. stuff. And so here it was a musical instrument. And I'd already started on piano and violin in school. This was something new. This wasn't my parents' musical instrument. It was something different. And it was really loud. And I think that had a lot to do with it. As, you know, as loud and obnoxious as race cars, but it's a, it's music. You yeah. know, it's a musical instrument. And it's cool and loud like race cars. That's, yeah, that's, that's a very cool memory was he actually playing some kind of large amplifier and was it really loud or was it just in in relationship to everything else (laughs) oh no i i I think it was like a little 
GA5 or whatever it is, a little oh my God. Gibson amp, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> but, That's hilarious. Yes, you know, when you're small, everything's big. Yeah. yeah. Well, not only that, it's just that, uh, you know, the, the radio and the TV in the house, that was the loudest thing that I'd ever heard. You know, a symphony orchestra, yeah, but that was the that was all the instruments at once. Mm-hmm. And like I said, I I played piano. We had a piano in the house, and I just started taking violin. I think, and uh, you know that, although it's it does annoy a lot of people when you're starting to learn violin, but it, it it's really not that loud, right? It's and a- I think the tonality of it has something to do with it too. You know, just. Uh, so there's something about a guitar. I mean, I just love the way a guitar sounds, especially an electric guitar. Just whether it's clean or it's distorted, doesn't make any difference. Chords, single, single notes, mm-hmm. just the sound of it's great. Everything, everything, everything a guitar does is amazing to me. I, I have to agree. Mm-hmm. I have to agree. It's a very cool and unique uh, instrument that's um, very versatile yep. and and, a, a, and it's, controversial. Okay. We have, remember, we've had tons of conversations on that. Mm-hmm. I mean, Ooh. we have scientists out there, Joel, that will tell you that wood doesn't make a difference. Yeah, nothing really makes a difference. <laughs> you could use a piece of formica and you're going to get the same sound. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I've, I've, <laughs> there's, there's this whole thing about tone wood, and there's some people who just recoil when you use the word. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, f- forget about the fact that the word tone wood has existed long before there were electric guitars before there were people <laughs> <laughs> and uh well just about but it it really it really touches a nerve with people sometimes so yeah we use the finest tone woods i mean that's a whole nother thing the boilerplate of the boutique world oh yeah you know yeah. and but uh you know it's some people just you 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 mention that word and they just go off <laughs> mm-hmm I, I, I'm going back to uh, you said you had a piano in the, in the home. Where was home? Yeah, Chicago, Illinois. It's a it's a small town uh, on Lake Michigan. <laughs> yeah, Chicago, tiny little town. Yeah, yeah. Never heard of it before. If but, you blink, yeah. you drive right through it. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Home of the one of the tallest buildings in the world. Yeah. <laughs> so did you? Um, after you after you heard this obnoxiously loud instrument, did you go running home and go, I need a, an electric guitar and amplifier right now? Oh yeah, absolutely, and and uh, you can imagine how I was greeted by my parents with, when I came up with that. They're they're like, no way, I don't think so. <laughs> Stick to your violin, son. Yeah, you got a no, violin, I, <laughs> right? What do you need a guitar for? My my mom was a jazz singer. She sang oh. with big bands, and my dad played saxophone and piano. So, hmm. wow. you know, the electric guitar. You know, so I badgered them. I really did. I kept bringing it up, kept bringing it up. And I'd be going to my friend's house, and they'd be showing me the Ventures albums, and we'd be playing that. And, you know, finally they broke down and, and said, okay, we'll get you a guitar. We'll get you a guitar, uh, but you, we're going to rent it for you. And they were really pretty smart. This is, uh, you know, and I suggest this to all you new parents. Rent the guitar first. Mm-hmm. You know, unless you're already a player and and it's just an excuse to buy another guitar. (laughs) (laughs) We all need that. You know, that I never thought about that, but that's a great idea. You know, if you have kids, make sure that they want to play guitar so that you can buy a guitar. If they give up, you can keep it. But but honey, we don't need a three thousand dollar guitar for junior. No. No, No, you do. (laughs) <laughs> oh yeah! Oh yeah! <laughs> See, I don't want one of those guitars with bad action and bad sound. Yeah. It'll just, it'll just discourage him. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Let, it's, let's, we've let's had get, that conversation before. Let, yeah, let's get it right, right out of the chute, and then that way we can eliminate the instrument. <laughs> <laughs> right. If you suck, it's not the instrument. It's you. We don't have to worry about that, and we can start working on on two full stacks. <laughs> <laughs> So they finally broke down. What did you get? What did you wind up getting? Oh, well, they rented, a, I think it was an LG1 or an LGO. It was a Gibson, you know, okay. a little flat top. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, learning the cowboy songs, learning the open open chords. It wasn't, you know, it just wasn't exactly what I, and by then it was the Beatles and then it was the Rolling Stones. And, and that's really what I wanted to sound like. I wanted to sound like the Rolling Stones. Nice. 
That's you know, our first so, one. Uh, the, the, you know, yeah. I mean, I mean, the the you know the big question has always been: Are you a Beatles person or a Stones person? You yeah. know, that's that kind of defines where you went musically. You know, yeah. and uh, yeah, lots of Beatles uh, people. Um, but you might be the first that was a Stones guy. Yeah, and, and I'm I'm digging that. Yeah, I'm man. totally digging that because I love the Stones. You know, I don't think I really made much of a distinction back then. It was kind of all. It was all groovy, man. Mm-hmm. You know, all of it, and you know, I because I, you know, the Ventures. Now that you know, compared to the Stones, the Ventures kind of sounds kind of trite. But uh, you know, nowadays, I guess if you look back on it, but it was all great. You know, it was all guitar music, and I thought it was, I thought it was all cool. Totally, yeah. except for the guy who was on on Lawrence Welk. Have you seen any clips of that guy playing? I'm I'm sure I have. I'm sure I. (laughs) Mick's got a third computer going now. He's got his iPhone. The cat is. He's a fucking monster. (laughs) But you know, I mean, as a as a kid, I'm sitting there watching Lawrence Welk, and and this is like my grandparents' music. You know, it's like, thank you very much. Turn on the Mm -hmm. bubble machine, and here he is. (laughs) <laughs> on his blonde neck Stratocaster playing through six twin twin reverb. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you are my sunshine. Right. You know, and, and you know, I didn't think that I didn't think that was cool, but now you watch it and you go, Wow, that, that guy was cat a monster. Right. <laughs> you know what used to be my favorite back in the day watching as as far as watching a show specifically to watch the guitar player when they would put the camera on him? was Tom Jones with Big Jim Sullivan. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, Big Jim Sullivan was kind of um, back in the in the studio day was, was Jimmy Page's parallel. Those were the two guys that were getting oh. all the studio work yeah. in, 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 the, in London at that time. And he was, yeah, I always used to watch, wait for him, you know, for them to put the camera on him because he wow. was just another monster too, so. Wow, you, see, you kids are a little younger than me, so... <laughs> <laughs> not by you know, much by the, my friend by the time tom jones was really big i think that you know it's i was probably onto hendrix by then or something i don't know it was uh, oh i'm i was too but I, you know i kind of stumbled across the, you know this and you know tom jones will always tell you he could have been a rock and roll singer too he had plenty of offers but he decided to do what he did because you know maybe there were more panties being thrown at him or something you know i'm not sure do but you think yeah maybe yeah. so uh, you've you've played for a while before you got into the other side of the business what were you um when you went out with i guess your first high school band or whatever was it was it surf stuff that you started with yeah i guess it was uh kind of surf rock or you know a little first band actually instrumental oh wow you know instrumental stuff and uh, and i remember playing in the junior high school auditorium and playing a song that I had, you know, written, use that's in quotes too, uh, but, you know, a song that we had made up, that I had made up. And I remember thinking to myself as I was doing this and presenting to the other guys in the band, it's like, is this real? Is this, can I do this? Is this, I mean, is this allowed? Hmm. It's just kind of like a thing I like to do on the guitar, and it's, I think it sounds pretty cool, you know, and then we should do this and the other guitar player, who's actually a lot better than I was, which has been the case in every band I've ever been in. <laughs> I'm but, sure you're being modest, but... No, no, I, and that's a whole other discussion, but, you know, surrounding yourself by people who are better than you oh, are. Oh, for sure. Uh, yeah, yeah. Which is what I've done my whole career, nice. and stood on the shoulders of, of other people, but it's a great learning you know, tool pr- presenting that to the guy and and, and like he had some no oh, well what if and then we could do this and do that and then we go out and we play it in front of these kids and i'm just thinking wow this is this is kind of crazy you can actually do this you can like make something up out of your head and then like people will like it <laughs> and it was you know to me that was the it was a validation mm-hmm. and uh you know because i was i was a shy kid i'm actually a, a pretty shy person i'm i'm not real pushy i'm you know people which is weird because a lot of what i do and have done over the years involves talking to a lot of people like mm-hmm. right now i'm talking i'm talking to you guys and i'm 
talking to a lot of people, mm -hmm. which is in the back of my head, I guess. But, you know, giving presentations, going into dealers, you know, standing in front of people. And it's it's terrifying to me. You know, I, I get real stage fright. And for me, as a kid, the guitar was, it was not only a conduit to be able to say things that I wanted to say without having to put my, you know, put myself on the line by talking. It, it was also kind of like a shield. It's, it's in front of you. It's between you and those people. It's kind of like okay. a, it, 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 you know, it's, you can deflect their death ray vision. You know? <laughs> that, that's a great way to look at it. And yeah. yeah, I mean, cause you, you do have to go out and, and deal with people and I don't, I don't want to use the word be, pushy because that's the wrong word but you you do have to be self-assured and and confident um because you're you're you know you're not only selling you're, you're selling yourself as well as your product if you're out there selling a product you know sure. and and you gotta you gotta be the guy you know you gotta put yourself out there it's like i know a little bit more about this than anybody else sitting out there listening to me talk to you about this <laughs> you know and then you gotta have the confidence behind it you know and if you're a shy person that I, that's that's it's tough to do you know? Yeah, it, it is, and 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 it was tough for me, and it still is tough for me because, you know, I I know I'm not the smartest person in any given room, and I've always known that. You know, I, I think I'm pretty clever and I'm a, a pretty quick learner, but I've never assumed that I'm the smartest person, and I, I've hooked up with a lot of people who think they are, mm -hmm. and you know, it, it, at an early age. <laughs> I learned that that those kind of people can be I hate to say manipulated but it's 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 like wow they have a lot of energy to get something done and you know if I just tell them they're doing a great job they're going to you know that that's all I need to do and they'll they'll do this for me. Mm -hmm. So you know I operated kind of that way which is kind of sneaky but it was really born from not wanting to be the face, not wanting to be the guy. I always wanted to be the guy in the back room who made this stuff. When we started the Hamer Guitar Company, that was kind of it. You know, like uh, my partner, Paul Hamer, was a very outgoing. He was the kind of guy who slapped you on the back. Hey, come on, we're having a barbecue. You know, come on over. You know, he, he was like a scout master. You know, he loved that. <laughs> You know, he would surround himself with people and be the center of attention. And you need a guy like that. And he was the perfect sales guy Absolutely. In, that, in that respect. And it was like, okay, so I would write all the copy for the ads and for the catalog, and he'd sign his name to it. You know, it was like, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and so we kind of created this persona of a guy who was a great player and uh, had this guitar company. And it was, it's kind of become... That's kind of like the boilerplate. That's kind of like the form that most of these boutique companies that have, have come up since use. You know, put a put a face with the name. Mm -hmm. And, you know, because people, people really like that. They like to put that face with, with the name or the product. And uh, there came a time when, you know, long after he was gone, the, the marketing people at Command, you know, they came to to us and well you know we think that this is what we need to do because look at all these other companies are kind of doing what we've always done and they're eating our lunch hmm. you know we, we've got a great product we were there first but you know they're they're doing better marketing than we are and we think that you should be the guy because you're the guy who designs everything you've been there since day one you're the one who's put in the you know 25 plus years every single day making this happen just go tell your story. I was very uncomfortable with that. But sense of survival, yes, I wanted, you know, I was very proud of what we did. I was proud of all the guys in the shop and the company and what we'd achieved. And, you know, I, I saw it as, okay, well, if this is what needs to be done, I'm going to do this to the best of my ability. I'm going to study it. I'm going to figure out how to do it. And, and we'll do it. So we started this this whole thing. But well, it all started from you working in a in a uh, a music store, right? Yeah, that that was one notch before the Hamer. Hamer grew out of a vintage guitar shop that uh, that I I was a partner in with Paul Hamer. You know, but uh, yeah, I'd been in the music business for quite a few years before that, just buying and selling old guitars, oh. uh, cleaning them up. You know, I could buy and 
Telecaster or an old Strat for 150 bucks or whatever, <laughs> hundred dollars, and mm -hmm. and clean it up, make it play right, and then take it out to the suburbs and sell it to some guy in a in a suburban band for twice what I paid for it. And and that was initially how I got into that end of it. And I was doing that, and so was so was Paul. He was doing the same sort of thing, and, uh, and a lot of people. Uh, Gary Gand, who's a really well-known and you know really great player and very successful music store owner and sound system uh, owner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Gary. It, it, Gary's another guy. He was uh, another guy that we knew, and the three of us played together in a band at one point. And oh, wow. uh, that's how I met Paul through Gary. I knew. I mean, I knew Gary previous to that. You know, so I worked as a technician for a place called Music Dealer Service in Chicago. You know, not every music store has a repair department that's capable of doing warranty service for synthesizers or guitars or amplifiers. Mm -hmm. So in Chicago, Music Dealer Service was the company that had had the warranty service franchise from all these different manufacturers. So mm -hmm. if, if, you're, if somebody brought in an amplifier that wasn't working or a keyboard or something, and you, you'd take it in, write a ticket for it, and then Music Dealer Service would bring their truck to your store once a week and pick up whatever you had for repair, take it, drop off what they were repairing for you mm -hmm. last week. I worked for them. I worked for them as a technician. Mm -hmm. And also, I, you know, three days a week, I drove the truck for the pickups to all the different music stores. You know, one, one day it'd be the northern suburbs, one would be the southern suburbs, and then it would be the city, you know, downtown, the 28-foot box truck downtown mm -hmm. Chicago. <laughs> now, were you, yeah. were you a guitar tech or were you an electronic tech? Uh, well, I started with the most basic stuff, like replacing speakers, you know, blown speakers, mm -hmm. and then reconing speakers, and then, uh, hmm. and then wow. starting to get. You know, there's uh, there are a couple of really good amp techs there, and you know, just starting to pick stuff up about that. And then, of course, uh, then I was another guy who worked there was the guitarist in my band. He was a guitar tech, so I learned a lot from him, and then started doing setups and fret jobs and that sort of thing. So. By the time I got to Northern Prairie Music, I already knew how to do a lot of this stuff. And, uh, you know, when I got there, zoned by Paul and, and uh, this other guy, Craig Hendy, who was a little older. He was an older guy. And uh, they really didn't know how to do any of this stuff. So it was, it was kind of a real, I won't say slipshod, but it was, you know, it was, it was not like a professional business at all. Well, they're probably just into the buying and selling and not much more of anything else yeah. you know to their credit they wanted to do all that sort of stuff but you know they, they were learning they were learning just like i was okay. you know, i wasn't yeah. i wasn't like a master builder or something mm -hmm. but you know at least i knew how to put frets in and how to file them wow i mean that's so, that, that's a whole art in and of itself you know and that's uh, that's the meat and potatoes so you know some guys <laughs> do it a lot better than others oh yeah you know i i am proof yeah. of that oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> well you know and, and this the whole story of no, well, I saw the Beatles on TV, and then I tried to make my own guitar, and then I bought and sold vintage stuff, and then I decided I'd make my own, and then, you know, and then we went to the NAMM show, and, <laughs> you know, I mean, this is, like, I, I jokingly refer this, to this as the boilerplate. I, I, I should probably, I could sell a PDF form that you just plug your name into it. <laughs> you know, it's like, exactly. here's your manifesto. This is... <laughs> this is this is your manifesto. This is your uh, your your corporate uh, statement of purpose. Mm -hmm. Here's your advertisements, built from the finest materials, the the finest tone woods with there most you go. most state of the art hardware. <laughs> uh huh. Just put your name here and let's go. It, you know. So one thing that I wanted to say is is that artisanal I hide glue. <laughs> <laughs> Nitro cellulose finish. That's right. That's right. I remember seeing the ads. You know, Guitar Player was the magazine. Yeah. There yeah. was no other magazines. It, you know, the other magazines, Hit Parade or stuff like that, was weird. You know? Guitar World was even not. Uh, not you know, even around. Right. You know? Uh, it wasn't even around at yeah, that time. Yeah, early, right. Late 70s and, you mm -hmm. know, up. Oh, no. They, they were around. Guitar were World? Uh, oh, Guitar World. Yeah. yeah. Guitar, guitar I'm, Player I'm, was guitar around. Guitar Player. Yeah. Guitar Player was the stuff. You yeah. were on the cover of Guitar Player. You were. You were the man. Mm -hmm. And I remember seeing the, uh, the, the Hamer ads, you know, BC Rich, 
and Gibson and Fender. And it's like they were one of those ones, you know. Hamer was one of those original. That's where you guys started that boutique stuff, man. I mean, well, it would probably be you guys and... Alembic. Alembic. T- yeah, yeah, I forgot Alembic about them. Yeah. predated Hamer. Yeah. Wow. Oh, yeah. I forgot about those guys. Yeah, but, sure. you know, st- seriously, though, they're... You you're like one of the you're one of the godfathers. Yeah. yeah for sure. You you're like the dude, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I I don't know. It's it, it, it we were we were just kids who were in the right place at the right time with a decent product, I think. And uh, uh, an incredible product. No, I mean, for sure. It, it's it's a little bit you being very humble. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you were building guitars that literally were making Gibsons look like junk. In my opinion, well, you know. the the interesting thing was, and and you know, you, there's a, there's so much discussion now about uh, well, vintage guitars. You know, when I see people saying, "Yeah, my 1972 Telecaster vintage," <laughs> you know, and I, it just it, it kind of it kind of blows my mind. Or the or the '60s, the late '60s Les Pauls, you know, are worth a ton of money now. You know, that's a two hundred and fifty dollar guitar in my mind, but right. Well, I mean the, the the Fender stuff, you know, the 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 big headstock stuff was crap un, until they ran out of quote unquote vintage '60s yeah. guitars to buy and sell. Then all of a sudden, these are vintage yeah. and they're good now. Yeah. They're good now. Well, it's like cars. Nothing changed. Right? They were crap, but now they're good. The, yeah, it's like cars. The Dino Ferrari, you couldn't give them away. Now they're one point two million dollars. Because why? Well, because all the original GT two fifties and everything else prior to that, you they're can't 30 touch million. For, yeah, you right. can't touch you for can't under touch thirty grand, thirty million. You right. know, so rising tide floats all boats. Exactly. You know, so <laughs> that's true. So now that you can get further away from fifty nine with that famous Les Paul that nobody ever. That, oh, mm-hmm. By the way, only twelve hundred were made, but I've seen twenty eight hundred of them. Um, <laughs> You know, once you get into 72, then they're going, you know, man, you got to get this 72. It's like Randy Rhodes' 74 Les Paul Custom. Mm-hmm. It's the secret to the tone of this Les Paul <laughs> is the pancake laminate <laughs> Exactly. Body. The biggest piece of crap ever made. Well, look, you, you know, <laughs> the, the, the phrase you probably want to use is it makes it sound like nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> there, you, there you go. Well, it's not a lie. Yeah. It's the only somebody market. shows you their kid. Yeah. Now it, that's it. what I call a baby. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> you know, ice cubes to an Eskimo, man, you know? Yeah. Well, you know, I think it's uh that's where some of the mind stuff kind of plays in. And if you can market right, yeah, well you can sell it. I, I, I distinctly remember that turn where all of a sudden I'm looking and something pops up as vintage. <laughs> and it's a large headstock micro tilt neck. I'm three bolt. Three bolt micro tilt neck. Going, this, you know, five years yeah. ago was considered the biggest piece of crap. Yeah. And why would anybody want one? And yeah. But now they're vintage. Oh, but you forgot too. You could take the heaviest pick that was ever made and stick it between the neck yeah. and the body. Yeah, there's that. Yeah. You forgot well, about that part. You know, there there is, and just to be the devil's advocate here. <laughs> I love really. that. I, I, I am half the time myself, so I love it. It is it is a period piece. It is representative okay. of you know yeah. of that time period. I mean, of course, they made twelve hundred that day, but it's still it, it. You know that's and and this comes into into play in so many different things. And, and you you mentioned uh, you know Ferrari the the Dino or 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 whatever. You know it's it is a, you know like an original Cobra. It is an original piece, whether yes. it's a great car or not. You know, of course, that enters into it initially. But other things, it, they are the genuine article. It's a collectible, and it is representative yeah. of of what that company was doing at that time. And and that is worth something, especially when they've moved on. Of course, when they've moved on and made even better product, it, it, it really it's kind of an odd thing, but. Nevertheless, it was made in the 70s. And, uh, you know, for for younger people who can't throw down tens of thousands of dollars for an original Stratocaster from the 50s, you know, they look at the next thing and it may resonate with them because maybe that was the era that they first became aware of the electric guitar. And so it's valid. That's absolutely true, true. valid. The thing that I keep coming back to that a lot of people don't understand because they weren't there is that there was that light bulb moment 
when you first picked up, and this would be, you know, in the late 60s, you picked up a 50s Les Paul with humbuckers and plugged it into a Brown Concert amplifier. And you just went, oh my God, this thing doesn't sound anything like my Les Paul with the mini buckers. This sounds like the real fucking deal. There was that aha moment for so many, especially the, you know, not just the American musicians, but so many of those English musicians who came over and toured in America. They were like, wow, I really hear a difference. And that was kind of where we were going with Hamer is that it's like, wow, you know, we're, we're selling these guitars for 10 times what Gibson can get for their brand new stuff. Wow. We're selling them to the biggest bands in the world, mm -hmm. the most famous guitar players on the planet. We're selling the old stuff that's, you know, 15 years old for 10 times what a new one costs. Seems to me there's a business opportunity here to make something that doesn't cost as much as a vintage guitar, but, you know, has those attributes, kind of feels like it, smells like it, but most of all, sounds like it. And, and that was what we were thinking. The fact that it was more expensive than a brand new Gibson, you know, that, that really wasn't our thinking at all. Didn't enter into it because we weren't dealing with stores. We weren't, you know, we had no wholesale price we we had no you know end column deal for distributors we were just selling directly you know knocking on that stage door and going hey mr leslie west check it out <laughs> a flying v with a maple top you've never seen one of these before and plug it you know and as soon as they plug it in well maybe not leslie west but a lot of guys who were playing brand new gibsons or brand new fenders they would plug in the guitars that we brought, just like the vintage guitars when we were hawking those backstage. We would bring them a Hamer guitar, and they'd plug it in, and they'd just go, holy shit, <laughs> how much? <laughs> and we'd be, we'd be like, well, uh, $1,200? They're like, hell yeah, and they'd get the tour manager, you know, with a briefcase full of cash. That's so cool. <laughs> nice. You know, yeah. they'd count off those those hundred dollar bills and like it was a done deal you know it was that's how we started and we had no intention of ever going into into magazines or I shouldn't say magazines but we had no intention of going into dealers mm. or distributors it was purely just an extension of what we were already doing and that's knocking on the stage door with a tweed amplifier and an old telecaster and and saying check it out mm -hmm. wow yeah, and, and that's that's it's a whole different world when you go past that into you know thinking about manufacturing and dealers and everything, and um, you know that that's when that's when you have to start thinking about pricing structure and and you know margins and all this other kind of stuff. And you know I, I kind of started the same way, and it's like I I need to make X amount of dollars on this particular amplifier, you know, and mm -hmm. and you would you would knock again knock on the stage door and mm -hmm. you. They, they would play and go, uh, I love it, you know, how much? And there you go. It's, it's the same kind of thing. Yeah. But uh, when, I mean, did it just ramp up uh, so much on its own that you had to go there? You know, were you getting requests from stores? Or how, how did you wind up making the transition? Yeah, I, it happened fairly early. Some of the bigger stores like... Um, Pastore in, uh, in New Jersey and uh, Parker Music down in Houston. They had their finger on the pulse of what was going on. And these guys were also, I mean, you know, if you're a touring musician, you're going to these big stores because you're, you're, you're stopping at the big venues. You know, you got the afternoon off before sound check. You go to the music store. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what we all did, you know. You know, they'd ask about it. They'd say, hey, have you heard of this? You know, I, or, or they might even say, I bought this when I was in Chicago. Check it out. A couple of the bigger dealers won it in. They were like, well, you know, Bad Company's playing this and Jethro Tull's playing this and Wishbone Ash is playing this guitar. How can we get one? That's how it started. And we, we had to learn the whole thing about, uh, you know, how the discount structure for dealers worked and the markup and everything. You know, we learned it pretty, you know, we knew some of it because we were in the business. We were right. buying stuff and selling it. But, I mean, yeah, suddenly we had to apply it to what we were already doing. It was another tier. 
And then after too long, they, of course, and this is how it always goes, they come back and they go, well, these are really great and, you know, we've got a market for it, but, you know, we could sell a lot more if you could come out with a guitar that's a little more mainstream and it's cheaper. Yeah. <laughs> and that, you know, and that's that's just how it started. So, uh, you know, we were like, well, hell, let's give it a shot. Mm-hmm. I took a 59 double cutaway Les Paul Jr., plopped it down on a piece of paper, traced the outside of the the body and said what if we put humbuckers on this bitch because nobody had you know nobody really done that you know les ball jr had p90 on it you right know? yeah right or special had two so we're like okay let's do that and then the idea well how about if it's strung strung through the back like a telecaster we can get those telecaster bridges because you couldn't you couldn't buy at too many aftermarket parts at the time you know it wasn't like you could you know get on the computer and go to 10,000 sites, you know, uh, Stu Mac or whatever, and, and uh, right. By a get all the replacement parts. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, there was no tone pros. There was no, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. n- none of that stuff, you know. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we were, we were dealing with what we, we could get. So we made a little cut down guitar, and that was the, we call it, in a brilliant marketing move, we, we called it the Sunburst. <laughs> Of course, we, wasn't, we weren't thinking, well, you know, in six months, we're going to have to make one that's black. So what are we going to do? We're, what are we gonna do? Call it the black? The black burst. Yeah, right. You know, so <laughs> I don't know. You know, we, we weren't looking far out. You so know, the, we were, the, the first ones were sunburst? Yeah. The, well, the, the first guitar that we made was called the Standard, which was essentially an Explorer with a maple top. Oh, okay. And uh, it was kind of like a morphing of two of our favorite guitars, the original uh, Explorer and the uh, Les Paul standard maple top binding. So we put binding and a maple top on an Explorer, and it was a guitar that didn't exist. Nice. And and at the time, Gibson was not making an Explorer. It was a failure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It was a failure. It was an embarrassment. They're very rare. Not many people had even seen one. Yeah, you know, we we had it was futuristic and, at the, you know when yeah, it came out, and, and and it was you guys that really brought that brought guitar back. back to life, right? And probably Rick Nielsen. <laughs> yeah, I think that you know Rick had a huge amount to do with that. And uh, did he ever know, have money in your company? Because <laughs> the guy never posed without one of those things in his hands, and it was always something like you know, there's one that looks just like him. Like the yeah. whole guitar looks yeah, like yeah, him. I've seen, yeah, I've seen that. <laughs> yes. It, I don't know if that's incredibly narcissist or if it's, <laughs> you know. It's Nielsen. <laughs> well, he he was a guitar collector before there were guitar collectors, really. Oh, yeah, I mean, wow. he, he was yeah. totally into it. And, and you know, we knew him from that side of the business before before even Cheap Trick had a record deal. You know, we were, we oh, were wow. Working with him, and you know, in the beginning, we had a lot of these big bands. I, I mentioned Bad Company and and Jethro Tull, hmm. Wishbone Ash. You know, Wishbone Ash. Their first gig was in front of thirty thousand people. You know, it's like that's how big these bands were. Nice. And you know, Cheap Trick was playing covers at Haymakers, a little you know, <laughs> two hundred person club. But we knew that they were going to be great. You could tell that they had something special. And mm. Nielsen is a genius. All yeah. those guys are fantastic. Robin Zander, what what a vocalist! Yeah, mm-hmm. oh, incredible. Yeah. Tom Peterson, Peterson, a yeah, genius bass player. I reinvented mean, they, the bass. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And you know, and, and they were friends. We loved these guys. We loved the band. And. You know, we we put them in an ad, or we put Rick in an advertisement that ran in Europe. Uh, you know, we thought he looked cool. He had the short hair when everybody else had the long hair, and you know, just the name Cheap Trick was on the drum drum kit, mm-hmm. and we just thought it looked looked great. It just, I don't know, we we did stuff that we wanted to do because we thought it was crazy or we thought it was cool, and you know, we weren't really thinking like a, a, a like business people, corporate, yeah. Yeah, but you know, and when Cheap Trick got huge and they were the biggest band in the land, you know, by the late 70s, you know, then by then everything that they did eclipsed anything that we had ever done for them. You know, they they sold so many of our guitars, you know, and we have Rick to thank for that. And I'll always be grateful 
I mean, wow. God, you, when somebody, you know, when the universe hands you something like that, that's, you oh, know, that's, yeah. it's like yeah. a hit single, you know, it's sure. like, wow. You were doing stuff that nobody was doing at that time. They were painting pickup covers, the knobs, you know, he had that one checkerboard uh, uh, explorer type mm -hmm. guitar. And, oh, yeah. And the, the pickups were oh, checkered. Paid, yeah, yeah. And, you know, it was like, how'd they do that? I remember we, because when they were big, I mean, when they were like the biggest thing going, the live at Budokan mm -hmm. thing, when they did that, it, you would see him in a magazine and you could see 15 different pictures. He didn't have the same guitar twice. <laughs> and out of those 15, 14 of them were Hamers. Mm -hmm. And every single one of them was, I was like, do these guys just make guitars for him only? Just for him, right. Yeah, like, does he actually, is this his own guitar company and he's just pumping money to get his own guitars out of them or what? Well, you know, he, he financed, we should have given him stock, I think. You know, that's probably would have been the, the that would have been the bro thing to do. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, because, you know, being on the East Coast here, I never saw him in stores in those years. Well, yeah, I have a yeah. story about that too yeah. you know i mean i and i lived way out in the country and i never got down to washington music until i was able to drive myself right chuck levin yeah, yeah my dad was not going to drive 50 miles to a music store for me right and so i yeah. only had the local mom and pop shop and they just it was unheard of mm -hmm. you know we had like two les pauls and a strat or two you know and a telecaster right so so it was it was it wasn't until later and then i got to see one and play it and i was like my god these things are amazing yeah i had uh i had a you know like you said they they weren't in the baltimore area they were in the washington area before yeah, yeah. they were in the baltimore area exactly because you know, it was because, a bigger scene i mean well chuck levin's it's, it's yeah, huge it's I mean, chuck you know, levin's right mm -hmm. um and I'm, I'm joel i'm sure you know the name of that store it's been around forever oh washington, yeah washington music washington music yeah, yeah so i i went into one all of the shine Oh, oh yeah, Paul Ab Schein. absolutely. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I went into one of the local music stores up here, and I was uh, I had seen a hammer in, in some ads, and I knew somebody that had one, and I went, I've, I've got to get one of these guitars. Yeah. Uh, and this was 1986. Uh, okay. You know, and uh, I went into the local music stores. You got any hammers? No, we don't. We don't carry hammers. So you got to go all the way to Washington. But we have these other guitars. Um, so I wound up buying one of the other guitars and then a second one of the other guitars, you know, yeah. the, the, the big manufacturer around here. Um, but anyway, the, I, I... A Dean. No, it's not... It, not here, it. you buy this Dean. <laughs> it's it's like a hammer, only different. Only it's, the headstock's four feet across. Yeah, it's totally different. <laughs> yeah, we actually just had Elliot on. Too, yes, so, yeah, but we it, love Elliot. But, but, you know, but that's that was back when... That was Dean Zelensky's... Dean. Oh, back yeah. then. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. But I, uh, you know, that was the first guitar I actually went to seek out that was outside the norm, like you know, a mm. Strat, Les Paul mm -hmm. kind of thing. The it, hammer. It was a hammer, and yeah. it was it was the double cut, and you know, it was the freaking junior man. I just fell in love with that. I, I always liked that, and when I saw you know the hammer was doing that, and there was humbuckers on there, and you know that that's the first guitar I sought out. The, so the that's Z thanks to you. Yeah. Now I and now I can <laughs> afford one. I should have kept one. <laughs> <laughs> well even the the ones from the 90s the early 90s are even getting too pricey it's really? it's yeah you know i mean and and people would always ask back then well do you think these will be collectible someday and you know i just couldn't get my head around it you know yeah. we're never it's like no this you know what's collectible are these you know this this es5 you know that that's collectible you know that's that's a the real thing we're just making tools for musicians mm -hmm. that are cheaper than vintage guitars a friend of mine actually i, I was uh, in the band i was in a, a little bit later than that i guess went to uh, went south and went to watching music and uh, i think he and his brother both picked one up but there uh i don't know if you remember this guitar or not i don't know if you remember many guitars his was uh it was the junior style body it was fuchsia and mm -hmm. because that you know everybody wanted the fuchsia guitar back then it was it was that era you know but this <laughs> what were we thinking right but we were this one the uh <laughs> the 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 bridge pickup three three yes three uh single like a humbucker and a half what was the deal with that who came up with that what was it tell me about that because i never got oh, the, a chance to ask anybody about it well you remember a company called mighty might sure yeah 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 randy zacuto 
He had a thing called the mother bucker, which was, uh, you know, one big plate with three coils on it. And I guess the idea was you could configure it any number of ways. And, and that's really where it came from. You know, it's, you know, outright steel, but it never worked right because there's there's some sort of crazy thing happening. And, uh, you know, I'm, I, I'm not a pickup maker. I just play one on TV. Mm-hmm. So I'm not really sure, you know, how it works, you know, the reflection of the of the magnetism or the way the the, the magnetic flux bends because there's one plate. But you, you could get it to work, but there it wouldn't really do anything useful. And but it got me to thinking, hey, this is kind of looks cool. Sure did. But mm-hmm. and we're trying to, you know, there's right about the time when when. Uh, Guys were trying to get more of a cleaner sound, you know, the, that clean strat sound was coming back into rock music. Mm-hmm. But people wanted to switch between, you know, it's, it's the old the old story. I want a Fender sound and I want a Gibson sound by flipping a switch. Can't you do that? Mm-hmm. And so my way of solving that was to just to house a single coil with pole piece magnets right next to a humbucker and just surround it with one bezel and also the um the ibanez was it the I- iceman or one of those guitars they had with like a giant pickup like that hmm. and so it, you know it's not uh you know with a, a lot of this stuff it's you know it's this kind of collective consciousness i think you know we all grew up doing the same stuff looking at the same guitars listening to the same music and you can't help but, you know, either you're borrowing actively from things that you see around you that other people are doing or being, a, you know, influenced by that. Or you're you're just in the same headspace as somebody else who's thousands of miles away. <laughs> you know, you yeah. both wake up that morning going, yeah, wouldn't it be a great idea to, like, make the headstock go upside down? A lot of times it's that kind of thing and and you just you just do it because it's cool and you're trying to put food on the table and you want to make cool stuff Mm -hmm. and so you you just do what you think is happening and then you know 25 years later then there's this thing called the internet and everybody's an expert on who stole what from whom and which (laughs) came first and you know it's it's like a copyright thing you made guitars for all the beatles yeah actually every even ringo even Ringo. Two, I think he has. <laughs> wow. How, how did that go down? In each case, it was a different thing. You know, for uh, for John Lennon, it was, once again, our, our friend Rick Nielsen, who played on the Imagine Sessions. Oh. And he knew he was going to go play with Lennon, and he was a huge Beatles fan, a huge John Lennon fan, as were we. Mm-hmm. Oh. And he wanted to give him a gift of a guitar, and he asked us to design and make something for oh. him. And, you know, I can't, I can't remember who came up with the exact idea of how to paint it or, or whatever. You know, you know, we knew it was for John Lennon when we made it. And uh, he gave it to, to Lennon. So that was a gift. You know, it wasn't like Lennon called up and said, hey, will you make me a guitar? And with Paul McCartney, it was, uh, you know, through, through somebody on the crew who, who we knew. And uh, they approached us and wanted a guitar. Paul wanted it, wanted the guitar, so we we built it for him. Harrison got a guitar once again, one of those brilliant marketing moves. A guitar we named the Prototype. <laughs> How stupid nice. is that? Well, was there was there more than one? <laughs> yeah, it was the model name. <laughs> we have five thousand of these prototypes. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> We're well, still- I I get emails like that. Hey, uh, excuse me, Mr. Danzig. Uh, I have a guitar that I think may be, <laughs> may be a, a prototype guitar. It says prototype on it. That is that is the cruelest, funniest joke <laughs> That's awesome. on the planet. That is awesome. And God bless you for doing that because there's got to be every guy that owns up that guitar case that his grandmother had. It's oh my God, grandma. A prototype. It's a prototype. <laughs> okay, we got to figure out how to kill grandma and then take the guitar and Stop sell it. it. <laughs> oh, you know, when they make the movie, which they never will, I'm surprised they wrote a book about it, but when they make the movie about Hamer Guitars, of course, you know, the character, character who names it will go, I've got an idea. <laughs> this will screw with everyone. But that isn't, Perfect. you know, that isn't what happened. We were just too... 
stupid. So, so George had the prototype. Yeah, we we uh, actually traded it to him for a couple of. You know, he wrote a book called "I Me Mine." We traded him for two of those books signed. Oh, oh my and, god! Uh, I still have that. I'm awesome. sure you do. I was going to say, awesome. who's got him? Yeah, You've got at least one, right? Yeah, and Ringo. I think we knew somebody on the crew. Yes, yes, we we knew a crew member, and you wanted a guitar, so. Wow. Hey, we'll sell them a guitar. I dealt with so many people, and you know, it's literally. I have the files, my my all my files, and it's it literally is air supply to ZZ Top, and everything, and you know, stuff in between. I go through it every now and then, and I, and I go, oh, oh, I forgot completely about. Oh yeah, Chris Stein, Blondie. I forgot about that one. Ah. You know that that sort of thing. You know, and um, Elliot Easton, right? Oh yeah, well Elliot had a ton of, course, of it. yeah. Left hander. Mm-hmm. Still a good friend. Still, you know, an amazing what player, a, underrated. Oh, I don't know, under not not with the people who knows know his work. Right. He's yeah, fabulous yeah. guitar player. Slick licks Elliot. Yeah, man. Oh, you know. Yeah. He he was I he was an example that I used to use for how for a, a really good solo, you know. You get in and you, you say out. what you're going to say, yeah. you get out. And, and, boy, and, and really well constructed, yeah. well thought out solos says a ton. Whether it's a lot or a little, I mean, just right. gets it done. Yeah, yeah. And and the cool thing is that you can hear all his influences, but it isn't like a straight rip. And I love that sort of you know, like uh, Audley Freed is another oh, guy yeah. who's just Audley Freed, you know, is so and goddamn oh yeah, good. and got to work with him and and know him and and you listen to the stuff that he plays and you you go, he's just playing homage to it, and that's. That's what great guitar players do. Yeah. You know, they 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 hint at their influences with a wink of an eye and you know, it's it's not trying to pass it well, sometimes it is trying to pass it off as your own, but <laughs> for the most part, I mean we we all came from somewhere. I have to ask you a question. You know Audley Freed, so you obviously know Cry of Love, right? Oh yeah. Remember that band? Mm-hmm. Uh, by far. I would say that was the closest thing to an actual extension of the band Free. If you mm. listen to that album, you could kind of like maybe get a, a vision in your head that you know Free would kind of sound like this if, if they, they would around, if they were yeah. still around and it kept going. Meanwhile, he played a Strat on that entire album. Is that crazy? Wow! And Paul oh, yeah. Kalsoff, of course, was Mister Fifty Nine. Right. Right. You know, no, right. They, I saw them in a club. It was in a mall. In uh, San Jose, and I took two friends of mine who were editors at Guitar Player, actually, at the time, and we went to see them, and it was sublime. It was... Yeah. And he played... The tone was so crystalline. He played a Strat through a... um, Marshall 50. No, no, it was the Fender one with three tens. Which one is that? Vibro King? Yeah, Vibro King. Yeah. You could count the wines on the low E string. That's how clear it was. Yeah. Wow. And and it was and then I'd never seen a band that totally dominated your thoughts when I can't even explain it to this day. I'm I'm let me start again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it was just it was just amazing. The recordings were great, but seeing them live, it was just the open space that they would and that's what they had in common with free was that open space yeah Mm -hmm. yeah the sound between the chords between the notes the pauses when there was nothing just the open air they knew how to work with that what is it noel gallagher's Uh, high high flying birds or whatever they're called and you know know. i don't i I was watching them and um i was kind of digging it and then it occurred to me that it's like I'll, so much of that music in that genre you, they there's so much strumming there's so much da 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 of the rhythm guitar there's so much it fills up you know it's kind of like the the edge or something you know but it, mm-hmm. it, the edge at least there's some some openness and it's a sound i'm not saying it isn't cool but right there's something about American music, about root American music, that uses the openness, the space between when you're playing as part of the music. And that's something that's, it, that's so, for lack of a better word, it's so pro. It's so, you know, that's, that's where you connect. 
it's not how many notes you can put in there. Of course, the Ramones mm -hmm. go completely against this, but... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, but that's another sound. You know, right. it's like all, you know, and, and and Noel Gallagher, you know, that's a sound. I'm not mm -hmm. saying it's not good, but it's like what speaks to me so much is is music like Cry of Love, mm -hmm. you know, and, mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, and, and, and Peter Stroud understands this as well. And oh, he yeah. play, he's yeah. playing with, with Audley. But and that's what I love about Peter's playing is that you know he, he understands and Cheryl Crow understands that un, understands that mm -hmm. or at least you know the, the band as a whole. They understand that there's, it's not just filling up every single space with a note. Right. It's yeah. you gotta let it breathe, and that's you know and cry of love. That's what they had in common with Free, and Free was great for that. When you see some of the live footage. Oh. Andy Frazier is the real underrated guy in that band. Simon Kirk, oh, yeah. you know, laying it down, and Frazier. Now talk about knowing when not to play a note. <laughs> that cat knew where it was at. Nobody plays like that. I mean, those are the guys that inspired me, and like Jack Bruce, uh, Andy Frazier. Andy Frazier was the reason I, I bought an EB3 and played it through a 100-watt <laughs> stack. Oh, That's nice. too cool. That right. was, that is you know, cool. and once again, it's like the that whole vintage thing we're talking about. There was a reason why people were attracted to vintage guitars, not because they're vintage or they have mojo or they're, you know, or they cost a lot of money. When you pick it up, you just, you plug it in and you go, oh my God, there it is. Right, that's, right. that's, yeah. that's what all this other stuff won't do. Right. Yeah. And, and that's what was happening in the, in the late sixties. And, and you get an EB3. And you plug it into a 100-watt Marshall head with two cabinets. That is so cool. And you turn the sucker up, and you just go, <laughs> and you hang there on. it is. And you get Jack Bruce. <laughs> well, now that's a funny, that's a short-scale bass, right? That's like 30, yeah. 30 inches? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 30 and a half. Yeah, 30 and a half. Uh, yeah. yeah, and that's w when I made the first instrument, which is a, a flying V bass. It was essentially an EB-3. And it's that scale and that bridge, and that was the first Hammer guitar. That was the, you know, I made it for myself to play in a... Oh, wow. That you know, is so cool. But it was a Flying V. I wanted a, I wanted a Flying V bass, and there wasn't one, or at least none that I knew of. It's amazing that you started these this thing. This, this I mean, event. because, you know, nobody had done it. You know, well, I, I'm I, sure I'm sure somebody had done it. You know, I, I, I just, I didn't v know bass? of it. Uh, I don't think so, man. I think. Well, I mean, there might be one out there somewhere that somebody yeah, I mean, built somebody, for themselves, somebody, maybe. Yeah, but I mean, as far as you know, a manufacturer that right. would get it into the professional's hands. Right. That, it's, a, it's a hell of a place to start. Like I said, we, we were in the right place at the right time with yeah. the right product, and that's yeah. that's what it was. It wasn't that you know we had an idea that somebody didn't already have. I wanted a flying V base because I loved flying Vs. And I had a '59 and. I love the way they look. And, uh, you know, the only way for me to get one was to do what we did. And that was, you know, John Montgomery, who's one of the first uh, partners in Hamer. He and I built that guitar. And mainly he he mainly did it because I was learning from him. But, that you know, I told him what I wanted and worked with him in his basement shop. You know, because I wanted it for myself. I just wanted something cool at other people didn't have and you know i it was a sight gag it was the first you know it made it look like a les paul custom it was black with the multi-stripe binding i screwed a, a sg you know that nylon handled whammy bar i screwed it onto the eb3 bridge <laughs> wow. and you know just so it would look cool you know and, yeah. and you know and that's how it started and we wow. just it just one you know it's one step after the next you do this it's cool it leads to that leads to this and that's that's just the way it's always been for me did, did you build more than one of those mm, i don't think so i don't think there was another well we may have maybe years later there might have been some flying v bases but do you still have it <laughs> oh yeah i still have that first base nice yeah it was stolen off oh, the wow. stage uh. and my uh, i was playing a club in janesville wisconsin 
And in between sets, somebody grabbed it off the stage, you know, jumped down behind the stage, down a flight of stairs, and then out through the basement window with it. But it was really cool. It was like when you have a guitar that nobody else has and people know about it, he walked into a music store and the guy instantaneously knew what it was and he he called us. That's cool. And said, and as soon as he reached for the phone, he said, you know, he grabbed the guitar from the guy and said, here, I think I might know somebody who wants this. And he picks up the phone and the guy realized I'm screwed. So he ran out the door, <laughs> but I got, I got it back, you know, and, and so I've, cool. for, I've forgotten who that person was. And if you're out there listening, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. You know, that, and once again, you know, there's so many hundreds of people out there, if not thousands, who've done good stuff like that, mm -hmm. who are part of your career, you know, part of the things that. You know, that's what moves you along in your career. There, there are always people out there who are contributing to where you're going, knowingly or not. Right, right. And, sure. you know, and you, you owe a debt of gratitude to those people. You know, it's, it's the right place at the right time and the right people. And, the, and that stuff you, 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 don't, you don't think of, you can't plan, you mm -hmm. know, you don't expect. It just happens. And, yeah. you know, it's, it's, that's the great part of the journey, you know. Yeah. I mean, these things happen, you know. Oh. And what I'm doing now is kind of come full circle. I was I, you just going to ask you, what are you doing now? Because you're no longer involved in, in Hamer, right? No, no. I've been been out of there for five years or more. And, uh, you know, it just came to the point where, you know, I'd had enough. We're, you know, we we're, we're bought by Fender. Mm -hmm. I worked for Fender for two years and did a lot of different stuff in all the different factories and in Sonata and Mexico and in the custom shop in Corona. And, you know, there are a lot of great people at Fender and a lot of people who are still my friends who worked at Fender previously and still work there. You know, so it was a real education for me. It was something I, I couldn't have paid for to, mm -hmm. to go to those factories and learn the things that I did. It was just time to move on because no matter how many great people there are in a big organization, some sometimes they have a life of their own. And, and that wasn't my life. It wasn't for me, you know, so I, I'm... I've moved down and uh, I'm still making guitars, but it's kind of like that flying V, the very first guitar. It's here's a guitar that gets stolen in another state and it's so singular, it's so original and it's so unique that when a guy brings it into a music store, he knows what it is and he knows who it belongs to. And so those are the kind of guitars that I love to make. And I'm making a series of guitars that I call signature guitars. And every single one is unique. And it's based on a theme that runs through the entire thing. It has a story. It has a, the whole inspiration that, that makes it what it is. And when I'm done, that's it. You break the mold and I move on to the next one. And it has a name. Uh, the first one I built like that was called the Crow. When you see that guitar, you know, you know, fuck, that's the Crow. Mm. <laughs> You know, it's not like that's a crow, mm -hmm. you know, one of a thousand that got made that day or even or even, you know, like the, the boutique shop, you know, or like PRS or something. Oh, that's one of a hundred that got made that day. You know, it's it's not that it's that's the, the crow. crow so far. You know, it, it's been it's been good for me. I've made, you know, a, a few every year and they're not cheap, but it's it's the real article. It's mm -hmm. the real deal. And uh, made by the real guy. Yeah. And, it, it, you know, I've always been a fan of of race cars and I got into vintage racing. And when I would go to a track and you see not only that's, you know, you see a car like, you know, maybe there were 30 of them made, but you see the one that, you know, from history, that's the car that Jackie X drove at <laughs> Le Mans in 1971. And it's $14 million. That's, that's it. That's, <laughs> right, the, that's the one. one. Yeah. Right. The one. And they'll go out there and slide those things through turns. Oh, yeah. And literally, I mean, these are crazy millionaires. Like, like still today? Absolutely. They oh, yeah. Will, they will yeah. rub. They will bang. And, and And let me tell you, there's a guy, right? The guy who owns the car, mm -hmm. maybe some gajillionaire, and then he's got a guy who knows how to work an English wheel that if that fender gets crumpled, you're not buying a fender, right? Mm -hmm. doesn't no, exist. They're, they're, they're making, him. They're making oh, yeah. a brand new fender for that car wow. uh, uh, oh, out of aluminum wow. <laughs> or magnesium, whatever year it is. I mean, it's crazy. I'm attracted to vintage racing just because 
of the history mm-hmm. and and once again you know that and it's brilliant equipment it was the state of the art at the time and they were made by people like i raced a car called a chevron which was oh. made in england yes and it was a small firm we're talking really small like a dozen people at its height but they made these world beating cars and and they're purpose built race cars mm-hmm. And this guy Bennett, he he came up with the whole concept. You know, he, they would chalk, they would chalk it out on the floor where the frame would go with chalk on concrete, and and you know, very seat of the pants. Yep. And it, they were world-beating cars. And you know, I just loved the history of how they were made, of the people behind it, and the fact that there's only so many of these in the world, and this is one of them. Yeah. And then to actually race that car on the tracks that it competed on, it's, you know, it's like stepping through the looking glass. Mm-hmm. Sure. That's the way I, I look at it. I was, when I was a kid, I went to the Can-Am race at uh, Elkhart Lake in Wisconsin. And John Surtees was, he's one of the, I think maybe one of, maybe he's the only guy. I could be wrong. But I think he's the only guy who's ever won the world championship both on two wheels and four, in Formula One and on motorcycles. And he yeah. was competing in the Can-Am, which is an unlimited race uh, race car series that happened in the late 60s. And uh, you could, any motor, four-wheel crap. drive, two motors, <laughs> yep. turbos, whatever you want. You know, unlimited displacement. Anything goes. It, crazy, oh, yeah, a- anything goes. dangerous. Wow. Crazy, crazy fast, crazy dangerous, you know, 900 horsepower V8s in cars that weigh 1,700 pounds. Oh, my God. It, With brakes just, that were 1970s. Yeah. <laughs> they, they would go 280 miles an hour down the stretch in Le Mans. They, uh, what do they call it? The, um, what was the name? Molson Straight. Molson Straight. 3.7 yeah. miles straight road mm-hmm. um, that the public drove on. So no guardrail. Trees are what you what wow. the roads line with, and they would do two hundred and you know sixty, two hundred and seventy miles an hour. Or, and they or were, if you, if you're Vic Elford, two hundred and forty miles an hour at night in the rain. rain. <laughs> Jesus. With a deadly turn at the end, right? <laughs> Running on bias ply tires. Okay, wow. they didn't have radials uh, right, back right. then. And uh, brakes that you would not put in a car today. <laughs> Take 280 miles to stop. <laughs> yeah. it, and those pretty guys, insane. Those wow, guys were nuts. were literally fighter pilots on the ground. But I went, I went to see this race. My dad took me. And, uh, you know, I was looking at his car. And one of the mechanics said, uh, you know, I was just a kid, you know. And, and mechanics are like, you want to get inside this car? I was like, yeah, cool. You know, so I got in the car, sat in there and, you know, I could barely see over the windscreen. I'm in this race car and I'm just like, wow, this is the coolest thing ever. And Surtees came out of his trailer, you know, with his togs on, he's got his driver's suit and his helmet. Mm. And, you know, he sees me in his car and, and I'm thinking, Uh-oh. oh, I'm, I'm fucked <laughs> now. <laughs> but he just, you know, he just looked and he smiled like, you know, like he got it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and it's like, that was something that has lived in my memory for so many years. And then one time I was at a track in West Virginia, Summit Point, and, you know, racing. It's this uh, two-day race, and all of these famous cars are there. And uh, I came out of our trailer. You know, we, we go in a big transporter with, like, seven cars, and all, all, a bunch of guys get together. And, they, you know, we have people who take care of the cars. And I was coming out of the trailer down the stairs, and there was a guy with his two little kids, two little boys, looking at my car. And I came down, and he, the kids looked up at me, and I've got my suit on, i got my helmet. And I just had this feeling of, like, totally through the looking glass. Yeah. yeah. You're repeating and, history, yeah. And I walked over, and I said, do you think they want to sit in the car? And the guy just looked at me, and he goes, right. wow, really? And, and I said, sure, come on. And, you know, and I'm not John Surtees. I'm not a world champion. But to a little kid, oh, yeah. and I just, you know, and they sat in the car, and they're like, wow. You know, and maybe they'll remember that. Maybe they'll remember that day. And, More and than that's, likely. More than yeah. likely. And that's the kind of thing. I mean, those are the kind of moments that. I mean, you can't buy that. Well, I guess you can, <laughs> but I don't know. Well, you know, it, but it's just not organic and, like and that. that that's, you know? the, I mean, that's the juice. Yeah, you, you can know? buy it, but it's then it's just staged and yeah, it's yeah. just another thing. And if you're, you know, if you're someone that's in a position to buy that kind of stuff for your kids, well, you know, it's 
I don't think it's it's as special as it could be if it just organically happens. Sure. To yeah. someone who never thought it would happen, and the kids never thought it would happen, and it's just it's just there, and that's you know again yeah, just a freaking great so, part of the journey. You absolutely. Know? Yeah, and it, and after that happened, I mean, I made it a point of any time that somebody would bring their kids into the paddock and they're looking at the cars and the kids were really had that, you know, the, they had the bug eyes, you know, mm -hmm. they're yeah. looking at that. I always made it, made a point of offering to the parents to let their kids sit in the race car. Cool. And, that you know, and, and I, and I'm just some schmo who has a, <laughs> has a car, you know, I'm, I'm not a famous race driver or anything, but still, you know, that sort of thing, you know, it meant so much to me as a kid just to be in the car. You know, I didn't know certes was going to come out and, and, smile at me I just to sit in the car was such a huge thing and i remember that and i don't know that that's the sort of thing that just means so much you know history history is important it's important for the things that we do today it's important for our growth it's it's important for our understanding of who we are and where we are in this world and i don't know and if, if something like that can trigger the instinct or the urge to look into history mm -hmm then, you know, I'm all for it. Well, and it's, this, it's the same way with instruments. Right. It, it, yeah. you, you, you never know what is going to become a point of history for someone. Well, that in kid that sat mind. in a car could be the next world's greatest driver. But, you know, it, but, and <laughs> you that, know? That, that, I mean, that could be a big point of history reference for sure. the kid. You just never know what that's going to be for anyone in any one time. You know, yeah. so yeah. The, yeah, that, that's just, it makes it so cool because it just has the potential to be or it might be but exactly that's cool know, stuff I, man yeah um i could talk to joe about cars for like an entire day <laughs> oh yeah i'm sure i'm sure um <laughs> speaking of uh sketching out chalk outlines of uh, you know on the pavement uh, joel do you do you do that with the new danzig guitars you just sit there and sketch something out and go from there or how how do you how do you come up with the, the next design for what you want to do the next one-off well I, I start with a basic idea you know basic you know, they're, they're all, even though they're, they're one of a kind, uh, and I do have another line of guitars that are just Danzig guitars that are team built and, and they're oh. made, made with, you know, I have a couple of the guys that I used to work with, uh, who, who helped me out and, and together we build them and it makes it a little more cost efficient and mm -hmm. cause I, I can't make enough guitars by myself. I don't have the time. I'm too busy with too much stuff. You know, so so this is one way for me to offer an instrument that was a little less expensive. I can offer them at a better price and also more of them. And it's mm -hmm. still not not a lot. You know, we're only making a handful every year. But, uh, you know, and it's also a way for me. You know, I, I love the team. I love being with people. You know, these guys are great people. And I loved working with them when we made the hammers. And, you know, I, I like being around them now. So, you know, they're, I learn stuff from them every day. So guys, guys from the way back from from Hamer, yeah, yeah. Some of the you know the really key guys, and then you know I've got a couple guys who are just really really good at what they do, and they and they they come from furniture background, you know, and uh -huh. uh, you know we we have a good old time, and at the end of the day we we have a beer, and you know I don't have to uh, apologize to an HR department. <laughs> nice, nice. No. So are, are these um. Uh, how are they available and how are your real one-offs available? I mean, can someone commission you to build something or do you build it and then put it up for sale? How does that work and how do people get your your other Danzig line? Well, the, the signature guitars, happens. it happens both ways. I've built guitars that, you know, I didn't know wh what they were going to be when I started and then slowly they, they evolve. I might get in, inspired by a book I'm reading or something like that or, or a, something I see. Mm -hmm. I was in a Japanese restaurant and I started, I saw, uh, you know, the cherry blossoms. And I remembered the cherry blossom festival in Japan because I've spent some time in Japan. And, and I started reading about it and asking people about the cherry blossom festival. And, and it kind of, you know, I started seeing this cherry red guitar with all this Japanese art on it. So, you know, that, that yeah. was, that's what inspired one. The crow was inspired by reading Kerouac and, and, and seeing crows and photographing crows on the side of the road and in the trees around my shop and uh, kind of seeing the, the parallel between like blues and rock bands that 
travel and musicians that that travel across the country living on their wits and, and crows who are really scavengers and and they're they're you know harbingers that of of you know they're they're storytellers they're they're in mythology they have very strong identities and i kind of saw the a, a parallel between the crow and Kerouac and Cassidy as they traveled across the country and touring bands. I don't know. It's, and, and so I, I just kind of worked on that premise and it, it kind of guided me as I was going along. And, and uh, you know, so I, I used the kind of materials that maybe a crow would pick up along the side of the road. And, oh, wow. uh, and the, finish, the finish on it is a, a frosted duco finish like the Nationals had in the 30s, oh. which is, uh, you know, it's a lost art to make that that kind of finish. It's and so cool. Wow. I'm and, looking at a picture of it right now. It's yeah, cool. and I did it in black, and it and it because I knew it would look, you know, it, on the one hand, it kind of looks, it looks like crystals because that's what it does. It crystallizes, but it looks feathery. It looks like feathers, black feathers. Mm. And, and I'd never seen it done in black. It, you know, traditionally it was either done in a clear, like a gold, or green and and I was pretty sure I could do it in black and uh, you know it took me a couple months to actually get the technique down but uh, those guitars are either something purely out of my imagination and they're either for sale or they're not and uh, and then I have people who approach me and they say what are you building what are you thinking about I want to buy one of your guitars and they just trust me to make something and they're buying it's like a, buying an art piece there's one right. of them i've also had collaborations where somebody had an idea of i'm kind of thinking of this and if i like the idea i'll run with it if if i don't dig it i'll, I'll say you know i'm just i'm not interested in doing that you know it's i've already done that 50 times and mm. you know i'm not interested in doing that or or hey why don't you call this guy at echo park because he does that you know, so so I can kind of pick and choose what I want to do. And that's what the signature guitars are all about. And, you know, I make two or three a year. And I keep the ones that really mean a lot to me. And eventually I'm going to show a group of them as a as a collection and uh -huh. tour and tour that. Yeah. But the Danza guitars are uh, a little more affordable. And, uh, you know, they're, I won't say generic, but we have three different models right now. And I've got plans for a number of more models. And it's a way for me to... To do stuff that's uh, I don't know more reminiscent of what I've done before, and cool. but still have a little room to stretch out. Nice. And we'll have we'll nice. have your uh, website links. Oh yeah. On yeah. the show episode there on the front page, and then when they go into the episodes uh, link, and that will live out there for perpetuity. That's right. Oh great. Yeah. yeah I'm, sure. I took my website down actually because it. Uh, I'm, I, you know, the weirdo factor. I get a lot of people who want to come by the shop. <laughs> and, you know, like I, I said before, I, you know, I, I love people, but, you know, when they show up on your doorstep and they, yeah. want to, they want a tour of your shop and, you know, you're working on something else, you know, it's, you know, and, and a lot of people just want to, they want to talk about this, that, and the other, but they're not really serious. So I took the website down, at least temporarily, because, I don't know, if, if you want to, one of my guitars bad enough you'll know how to reach me you'll figure it out okay and if anybody's serious out there and you really you really do want one of the danzigs um and you can't figure out any other way to get a hold of joe get a hold of us and yeah we'll let him know yeah we'll get it right to him yeah sure. you guys can be the filter absolutely there we'll take go. all the weirdos you can throw us <laughs> you know I, i've got a friend i got a well i wouldn't call him a friend actually <laughs> a guy a guy i know who tolerates me there you go <laughs> Who makes pickups and and he was like one of the he, he was, he, apparently he's like one of the guys on 48th Street who was like you know hanging around in the DiMarzio days and you mm -hmm. know back then and I think he predates Larry DiMarzio and Steve Blucher but wow. uh, a guy named uh, John Grail and he's he makes pickups he's like you, you show up at his house and he, he doesn't you know he's got one of those those answering machines if you call him that goes hello. <laughs> no one can come to the phone right now. You know, you know, old it's like, school, yeah, like yeah, a, it's like a real one with a with a tape in it. Yeah, from it's from the seventies. Awesome. Or something. And he never calls you back. You go over there and you <laughs> knock on the door and you see the curtain move and maybe he'll come to the door and sometimes, most times, no. It's like you know, I'm not. Nobody's home and you know he's in there. <laughs> the car's there. 
You see him walking around. Oh, yeah. You know, he's in a car. I'm COVID. right here. <laughs> no, no, you're not. But he makes um, incredible, incredible pickups and charges a freaking fortune of like $1,500 for a set of two humbuckers. Oh, and it, what? Whoa. Yeah, uh, what the hell are they made out of? <laughs> dude. Body you, parts. <laughs> you hear these things. It's the real deal. But, wow. you know, it, it, is it worth $1,500? <laughs> I don't know. You know, it's mm -hmm. <laughs> sounds like somebody that makes amplifiers. I won't put a name on that one. Well, actually, you can because see, Rick Derringer, right? He broke all that out. Yeah, for us. Well, well, yeah, but I'm still not going. There. I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> wow. But you know, I I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be the guy who's like behind the curtain, like a hermit, won't, won't come to the <laughs> door. But you know, I I can only you know. I'm doing a bunch of different stuff. I've got a, a video production company with two guys in LA mm -hmm. and we're doing a lot of production, a lot of content for, you know, for web and also for television. I'm wow. working on that. Cool. I'm, I'm in the middle of writing two books. Wow. And, you know, plus making these guitars and we're doing a documentary on, uh, on American roots music. And oh, so cool. I've, all these projects, you know, so to have people coming around, Mm -hmm. You're stretched thin, unless, man. Unless they're really, really, really serious about it. And, you know, just the and the high prices kind of, you know, that's deterred a lot of the tire kickers. And, sure, yeah. You know, and, and I'm not ashamed of that. At this point, what? why well, the hell would you even be ashamed of no, that? I mean, yeah. You know? No. You, I mean, you, you, look, you got, you got levels of this stuff. Absolutely. And, and that's just the way it is. I remember one time I went to this acoustic store and the guy, I, the guy said he want to play one of the best acoustics made. I don't even remember the name of it. Mm -hmm. And I played it. I said, this is the most incredible guitar acoustic wise I've ever held. And I said, how much is it? He goes, $25,000. I said, how do we get it back in the case? <laughs> how do we get it back in the case without putting a $500 dent on this thing? Right. And why did you hand me that? Well, at least you didn't have to go ring the doorbell and watch the, the curtain move. No, you know, and but he should have told me prior right, yeah, to hand me that guitar. Sure. Yeah, there are levels of everything. He was a broker. He wasn't a builder. Oh, okay. But it was, but it, you know, look, there's a price tag on that guitar because... It is what it, it is. It took the guy a year to build it. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> and he might, he was probably not as busy as Joel. Yeah, he probably wasn't making documentaries, writing books, and right. racing vintage cars, which is so cool. And does it, does it make the guitar sound any better? No. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, if you if it you played like I had been playing it for thirty years, but I mean, if you're buying something like that, just purely for the sound, you know, the, I mean, the sound has to be a given. It has to sound good. It has to sound great. It has to play. Yeah. I mean, that's a given. I've been making guitars for forty years. Sure. If I can't make a guitar that plays well and sounds good, then I'm in real trouble here. <laughs> yeah. True. So that's a given. But beyond that. It's, you know, I'm not competing with made in Mexico strats. You know, I, I yeah. mean, yeah. can you play a professional gig with a Chinese strat? Yes. The answer is yes. yes. And it's amazing that you can. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Without, without a doubt. You know, and you can load it up. You can take a $200 guitar and load it up with $600 worth of aftermarket stuff and have a pretty decent guitar. Sure. And if that's what you want to do, I have no problem with that at all. You know, do I want to play with a forty thousand dollar guitar on stage? Well, you know, I, I, I worry about stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But that's not what I'm making. I'm 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 making things that please me. And I'm mm -hmm. just lucky that there are people who will support that. You know, I, I don't make any apologies for the for what they are. And I'm you know, people want to say, Oh, they're not worth that amount of money. Well, for them, it's not worth right. that it's, amount of money. It's just I, not I worth understand. it for them. Right. Yeah. Right. You know, I, I can buy a brand new BMW off the lot or a used BMW off the lot that will kick the ass of most of these vintage cars on a racetrack. Oh, mm -hmm. sure. You know? Yeah. But that's not what you're buying. Right. You're no. buying you're buying a piece. You're buying a something, a piece of history, one of very few examples of something that is from an era and you know that's worth a lot to some people and it's worth nothing to other people sure yeah. and, and who's right and who's wrong there, there well, is no right and wrong yeah. right exactly. there's no right and wrong it's, it's for you right it's for you yeah. and and you know and there there's there's no argument about it as far as i'm concerned it's like you know well should you dress up for your gig 
Or do you just go on in a jeans and t-shirt? Well, I'm an artist, so I don't have to care about what I look like. You're coming from my music and my words, you know, and on the other hand, well, you're giving them a show. They're paid money, so, you know, you should look better than the audience. You know, it's like, it's like arguments like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, it, it's yeah. it's like, okay, it's w- whatever you believe, you know? Well, we're certainly not going to argue that point, but I, I, I am going to apologize for something, and that's, we got to kind of wrap this up <sighs> Although, at some point. But I, I, I could talk to Joel for hours. Absolutely. We, we, we got to do a whole nother car podcast. Oh, thing. my God. <laughs> I'd be in heaven. Yeah, but it's... Uh, <laughs> There's something I really don't know anything about. <laughs> yeah. yeah, sounds like uh, it. <laughs> right, it's sounds a, like as it. As opposed to guitars and amps, and I know a passable amount of stuff about that. <laughs> passable, <laughs> yeah. Well, are you, it, it, as long as you have fun with it, whether you know a whole lot about it or a little bit about it, as long as you have fun with it, that's, you know, that's, that's the first and foremost. Yeah, man. You know, so... Uh, I know we've had fun with this. Oh, uh, this hope, is crazy. Hopefully you have. I love it. And um, yeah, I, uh, well, I was going to say, how do people get a hold of you to buy your stuff? But it, it's, there's so few and far between. If somebody's really serious, contact us. Yeah, yeah. We and, can uh, get them over there. You know, continue well, doing there's a, what there you is, enjoy. There is a Facebook page. And, that, you know, that's so easy to keep up. I used to have a guy who did the website. Mm-hmm. But um, he started getting kind of aggressive about, you know, going out and talking about, what I was doing and uh, I, you know, it just wasn't me. So right, uh, right. Yeah. I didn't fire him because he's a friend of mine, but I, I just said, you know, l- I'm just gonna, let's just do a Facebook page and I can put something up every now and then. And he cool. still, he still posts some stuff, but well, there you go. Well, that's awesome. It you is, know. is the easiest thing to do for sure. Yeah. You know, I mean, websites are so five minutes ago. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Ours barely gives any traffic. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's iPods and, yeah, oh yeah. You know, that's what that's what hits us, but we have a web page cuz we, you know, I've got to put the show somewhere. Because we should. Right, exactly. <laughs> it's got to start from somewhere, yeah. but um wow, thank you Joel. Thanks for the whole history and uh Yeah, man. That I'm, is... I'm so glad you're you're continuing to move on uh in not only in guitars but in in all sorts of different directions, you know. Yeah, I love it. I mean, documentaries and racing cars and holy hell, what a renaissance guy, man. You're just, you know, it's just Keep it keep moving forward. That is awesome. And doing yeah. what you want. Yeah, man. Jack of all trades and master of very little. Well, I'm sure you've mastered, That's the, me. You've mastered the guitar end of it enough, my friend, because uh, people are still coming to you for... Uh, for, you know, not production stuff anymore. So that's yeah. uh, that's awesome. And, and that's what this show is about. So hopefully, cool. you know, Absolutely, people have man. learned a couple of things. So Joel, I know I have. <laughs> yeah, me too. I always I always learn. I, it's it's a bad day if I don't learn something. Exactly. So, Joel, thank you very much for taking the time. And I um, hope you had fun. We'll let you know when this is up. And you can, I know you can't put it on your webpage, but you know, at, least, at least you'll let people on your Facebook page know. And uh, if there's anything else we can do for you, please uh, get in touch with us and let us know. We'd be happy to. Hey, well, you guys are very welcome. Thanks for having thank me. Thank you, man. You're very welcome. Take care and have a great rest of the evening. Cool. You too. Thanks. And there you have the story. Holy crap. Wow. That was a lot of story. Yeah, man. That was a lot of story. That dude has seen it, done it, and been there and still doing it. Got the t-shirt and wore it out. Exactly. Went and got another one. Mm Mm-hmm. And now building another one. Building, totally building. Awesome guy, man. Yeah. Yeah. We could, uh, you you could talk with him for another day or a week. Yeah. I had a ton of questions, but I, you know, we only have so many. I know. It's not a car show. (laughs) And it's it's not a novel either. So we have to. Right. Yeah. (laughs) But uh, oh, that was yeah, that was fun, and um, yeah, he he was he was one of the granddads, man. Yeah, I put him up there with the with all the guys. Yeah, you know, you got sure. you got Wayne, you got you got uh, Leo, you got you got um, Les Paul, and then you got of course uh, Bernie Rico, Bernie Rico, and, and then and, Dean, and, even Dean Zelinsky, he was during that time. Yeah, younger absolutely. guy, but still, you know, doing it doing it during those times, man. For sure, when it was all changing. For sure, and those oh, I forgot to ask him about the five neck. We'll call him back. Yeah, no, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole that that guitar is probably a whole other show. Well, you know, we could talk about Rick Nielsen for oh yeah three weeks. So, for sure, yeah. for sure. But so, Joel, thank you, and yeah, we man. hope you enjoyed it. Absolutely. So, until next time, my friend. Damn right. Yeah, I'm Mick Marcelino. And Race you, car driver. <laughs> boy, don't I. <laughs> right, well, well, you know what? I can do that better than playing guitars. And you. I'm Jeff Bover, and I can't do anything. Yeah, and we are always saying. Onward. Onward. 
be sure and follow the show on Twitter at Amps and Axis. Also, make sure you like the show on Facebook. For news, comments, and everything else, visit the webpage, ampsandaxiscast.com. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.